Yesterday, we, I tried to talk about the properties of the mind. And the basic argument was, remember, we went through an incomplete list of mechanisms or properties or faculties the mind is working. And one of the basic assumptions was, if we want to understand the mechanism of the mind, it's not so much going into the mind-brain debate, nor going into the nurture-nature debate, which tells us what is genetic and what is educated, because both approaches can lead to relevant but unspecific findings, I've chosen a different approach. When we're talking about the limits to thinking, we are not talking from a psychological perspective. We are not talking about IQ. So Carlo might have an IQ of 180, and most of us maybe only 160 or 140 or 100. 190. 190, Alberto? No, Carlos. Um, so these are not the limits we're talking about. Okay? We're not talking about limits like genetics influencing thinking. And we are not talking about psychosocial construction of the mind limiting thinking. Like whether you had a adversive upbringing or you had a dysfunctional family life affecting your thinking process. Or you might have a traumatic experience in your life that affects your way of thinking. Okay. This does exist, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm trying to focus on three or four mechanisms, the way in itself, kind of an internal property is limited. And yesterday we went through a list of eight or ten aspects which determine the properties of the mind, and to some extent they also determine the limits to the way the mind is functioning. Okay? And I'm choosing four, more in specific. The first one I mentioned yesterday is about, I called them the limits to thinking bounded rationality. So the way we think is bound, is limited in itself. Doesn't say anything about IQ. And the first thing where there's good evidence is whenever we start thinking, we only start thinking within frames. We start thinking within priming, anchoring, and pyroxy incentive. I'll give you some examples for that. The second aspect that determines our thinking is forms of identification. In India, there is a saying about the monkey mind. I'm getting back to that. The third aspect I would like to mention is what we discussed yesterday, that the ego state is just a transitory state in between. If you're below or beyond, this determines the way you think. And eventually I would like to mention one study, which is relevant from my perspective, it uh, refers to psychopathology. <clears throat> so you remember this graph I showed you yesterday? That whenever we start thinking, we basically think within frames. Most of them are running through system one, and most of them are unconscious. And one of the most prominent findings is that whenever we have to make a decision, but after we think we make a rational decision on something in our life, choosing a partner, choosing a meal, choosing a specific etern um, travel uh, schedule, whatever we're choosing, or investment, we basically choose a relatively risk-averse decision. We make decisions along risk aversion. And this forms of risk aversion correlates to novelty seeking more or less by factor two. If you ask, for example, people to have 500 US dollars right now, or a 50% chance of getting 1,000 
US dollars in a week. What would you choose? Most of us would choose the 500. Okay? This is what risk aversion is all about. The second aspect I would like to mention, I showed you this graph yesterday, is whenever the mind is operating, whenever we produce mental representations, as we call it in clinical psychology, uh, we produce identifications. And Indian culture has the story about the monkey mind, which I found extremely helpful to understand how the mind is functioning. I'm learning that if an Indian wants to catch a monkey, you know what he's doing? He puts a bucket with nuts on the street. And the monkey tries to catch the nuts by putting his hand into the bucket, grabs the nut, nuts, but can't get the hand out of the bucket because he grabs the nuts. Okay, he gets stuck. So, this is the way the human mind is functioning. We are always stuck with something. You cannot be not identified with something. At the moment you're identified with the food you just eaten, you're identified with that graph, you're identified with my talk, you're identified with whatsoever. So we are always in a monkey mind mode. The question for, for psychology is how to overcome these forms of identification. The third aspect I would like to mention, according to our talk yesterday, is this developmental aspect of limits to thinking. I mentioned that the ego mind is just a transitory, fragile, instable mental state in between. There are states before and states after, and they can be empirically uh, uh, investigated, and they differ from each other. Within the ego state, where most of the frames and most of the identifications are happening, the world can look coherent from the inside. By just one way to look at it. When we change the level of gravity of our consciousness, we change the way we look inside and outside. Somebody on a more pre-rational level of consciousness, for example, might interpret the world more concretistic. Others on a higher level might interpret it more as a correlation or as a causality. On a higher level of consciousness, you might interpret the world, its properties, its outer and inner properties, through complementarity. There's a fourth bias. It's a psychopathology bias. This is the first out of a series of studies. I mentioned this one because it was uh, a very important one. Um, try to figure out the prevalence of psychopathology or mental disorders in Europe. What do you think? How high the prevalence of mental disorders is in Europe. It's a relevant figure for that topic. You have an idea. One way to look at it is a so-called one-year prevalence. Investigators look on one year going to the population and investigating and asking how many people in that population, in this case in the European population, actually the same data for the US, um, do have a mental disorder. What do you think? Do you have an idea? 1%, 10%? In percent? Another idea? 15%. It's actually the double. It's 29% to 30%. Okay? Meaning a third of the European, the same for the US, a third of the population do have a mental disorder with clear classifications being a disorder. I'm not talking about dysfunctional cognitions or adjustment disorders everybody has on top of that. So when we're talking about 
limits of the mind and limits of thinking, we have to think and take into consideration potential psychopathology. It makes a third to 50% of the population. The idea that when we start thinking about something, here in the room, in the classroom, at home, that the thought process is non-pathological, is kind of coherent and straight and sane, is statistically not valid. Do you see the point? 30-40% to have a mental disorder within a year. The lifetime prevalence. The lifetime prevalence means during the lifetime of a human being being affected by a mental disorder. What do you think? How high is that? Goes over 80%. So almost everybody on the planet is sooner or later affected by some sort of mental disorder. It's not a it's not a marginal issue. It's very substantial and very um, uh, frequent. I'm just referring to data here. The other thing, and the final thing I want to mention here, which goes back to the concept of countertransference. Have you ever heard that term of countertransference? Are you familiar with that? This is a term Sigmund Freud introduced 100 years ago, demonstrating that whenever a human being is thinking or behaving or perceiving or responding or reacting to others, parts of this responding and reacting and thinking is affected by his own biography he's not aware of and projecting into others. He's transferring parts of his own biography into others. So when the person is sitting there and thinking about himself, he can't figure out countertransferences. The countertransference aspects are only visible in a face-to-face -face contact with others. The logic behind the countertransference is actually also visible for philosophers and for physics. You know, it's in the same years, historically, when Kurt Gödel, the, the, uh, the, the philosopher, came up with the idea of the uh, theorem of incompleteness. It's the same years when Heisenberg determined the um, uncertainty. It's the same year when Freud described that human thinking requires considering the countertransference to better understand the human mind. It's always the same logic, you know? Thinking, physics, biology stays incomplete unless we consider an extramural system. How can we overcome these limits? How can we overcome frames? How can we overcome these forms of identifications? How can we overcome this transitionary state of the ego mind? And how can we basically overcome psychopathology? because they all limit our thought process. The one thing you can do is you create a situation within a group which allows you to brainstorm. If you start brainstorming in a group which has an atmosphere which is not judging and you can really kind of pour it out, whatever you think, free association, without any judgment, without any limits. This can help you overcoming your identification. Okay? And recorrect your own mindset. The second aspect that can help you overcoming the limits is what we yesterday discussed along with the creativity response. Okay? From meditation to exercise to nutrition. The third aspect, overcoming the limits of thinking, is meditating. If you meditate, if you do yoga, we discussed this morning, okay? If you do yoga, or if you do Sufi dancing, right? If you do Shaolin uh, exercises, what you're doing, if you do it in a repetitive way, if you do mantra, if you do the Catholic rosary, right? You know, 
In Catholic, they have the, the elder the people do this rosary thing with the, okay? The psychology and neurobiology behind it is always the same. It is, you start disidentifying with your mind, with your body, with your thoughts, with your emotions, by repetitive mantras. The idea of the mantra is not the theological content. The idea of the mantra is the repetition of 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 the repetition. Of the repetition of the repetition of the repetition of the repetition, so you get out of the monkey mind. And eventually, if nothing else, you go to shrink. <laughs> you do psychotherapy. Thank you very much.